Gray, and I'm the director of the Middle School Matters Institute. I'll be moderating today's call. Our presentation today focuses on establishing performance management systems to improve student achievement and using data effectively in the middle grades. The webinar will focus on several principles and practices within the performance management and school leadership sections of the Middle School Matters Field Guide. If you wish to learn more, the Middle School Matters Field Guide is available for download from our website. Our presenter this afternoon is Dr. Jeff Wayman, President of Wayman Services. Dr. Wayman is an education consultant focusing on the effective use of data in education. Dr. Wayman's research on database decision making includes efficient structures for creating data-informed school districts, software that delivers student data to educators, effective leadership for data use, professional learning for data use, and systemic supports that enable widespread teacher use of student data. He has over 25 years of experience in education. He actually began his research career with the Center for Social Organization of Schools at Johns Hopkins University and continued his research while serving as a faculty member in the Department of Educational Administrator, Administration at the University of Texas at Austin. He's won numerous awards for his research, publication, and teaching. And just so you know, he does have classroom teaching experience. He has served as a junior high math teacher in Kansas City and Salt Lake City. So from here on out, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Waven for his presentation. Hi, everybody. Um, Christy, thank you for that, for introducing me. And uh, I'm glad that I get to talk to you all today. The, uh, Appreciate everybody tuning in, and I'm pretty excited to talk about this stuff, and I'm particularly excited to hear what we have at the end of the webinar so that I can get your feedback on things. Um, as Christy said, I'm a former, uh, former middle school teacher myself. I taught junior high math. Um, that'll soon become evident through my behavior. Uh, luckily, you guys are used to that. Um, and I've been, uh, I've been researching data use for 11 years, almost 12 now. Um, the, one of the things that I know from, uh, from my junior high days is how important the principal's role is. And I knew that when I was a junior high teacher. And as I began to research data use, um, I began to see that in just about every school that I visited, um, just about every teacher I talked to, just about every principal I talked to, it was reinforced to me how important the principal was. And, and not just my research, everybody else's research has borne this out. Um, and so, so I'm happy to be talking to you today about, um, about principal leadership strategies. I should say that, uh, you know, Christy mentioned that I'm a consultant. Um, I left academia, I left the University of Texas about a year ago to start my own consulting business. And that's been a really good opportunity because I, I do this data use research thing full time now. And not only do I get to do research, but I get to help um, schools and districts and organizations that help schools and districts think through these data use problems. Because as you guys know, it's not nearly as easy as, uh, as the senators and the newspaper people might like to make it sound. So uh, we're going to talk about some things today that principals can do to uh, make data use more effective. Um, and we're going to have a good conversation about how some of my research and that of others uh, bears on this. I think it's true that data use lives and dies in the principal's office. Um, while I believe that, I also know that it's hard. Um, it's hard for you all that are principals and administrative teams because you're in the unique position where the levers on your time and your efforts come from both above and below. You know, principals are responding to, uh, to issues that, that they get from central office. They're responding to issues that they need to deal with with their staff around the building. Um, and so you have a lot of inputs on your time and on your actions. It's also hard because university prep programs haven't prepared principals well to lead for data use. Um, look, none of us knew how to do this. None of us were prepared to do this. It, it hit when No Child Left Behind came, and we've been trying to play catch up ever since. There are some university preparation programs who are attempting to prepare principals. When I was at UT, um, I got to teach a class every year to prospective principals um, who were going people who were going to go out and be principals, and I got to teach a class just on data use. In fact, I 
cast it around these 12 strategies that we'll learn about today. But that's just 20 people a year. Uh, we don't, nationwide, we don't have a scalable model yet on how to prepare principals. And so um, the fact is, through, through all of these things, we're building this plane as we fly it. We're, we're making it up as we go along, and we're doing the best that we can. But luckily, um, research like that that I'm doing and other people are doing is finding ways that principals can make this really workable and, in fact, um, believe it or not, really enjoyable. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today is some uh, concrete leadership strategies that are specific to data use that you all can learn and employ and put into your own practice. Before we go too much further, I should tell you where I'm coming from on this. It's uh, helpful to know who's in front of you. Uh, first of all, my focus and the focus that, that we have today is on instructional improvement. Um, the, uh, th there are many different uses for data, and I'm a strong believer that if we're going to talk about data use, we need to say data use for what, for what purposes. Um, Instructional improvement is one purpose. There are a lot of other ones. There's human resources, there are bus schedules, there are financial things. Um, our focus today is instructional improvement. Not that those other things aren't improvement, or I'm sorry, not that they're not important, but that's the, uh, that's the box that we're going to draw around data use for today. Um, in my world, data don't happen, or data use doesn't happen as something extra to what you're doing in your practice or what your teachers are doing in your practice. In my world, uh, data are used in the course of everyday work, not a brand new thing that we do. Data use is just getting more information, right? And there's no, no place in your life, in your professional life or your personal life, where you stop and use your information or your data. And so uh, when I look at data use in schools, I want it embedded into everyday work. Um, I've done enough data use research and cultural research to know that the, that the way you build a data use culture is to build structures and practices that will develop this culture. We read a lot in data use research that it's important to build a culture of data use. And people talk about it like that's an activity that you undertake. Well, you, know, you crack your knuckles and I'm going to build a culture of data use. Um, culture doesn't work like that. Culture works, especially in, in organizations, um, by putting in structures and processes and habits and ways of thinking. And if you put those in and if you continue to act and live that life, you turn around one day and you say, oh, hey, we have a culture. And so that's my lens on culture. Finally, um, maybe the most important core part of my belief system on data use is that data doesn't drive anything. Um, you'll never hear me say data-driven decision-making because I don't believe in that. I don't believe that data drives anything. I think professional judgment drives what we do. And, uh, and so I'm a strong believer that we don't, we don't get moved around by the data in any way. Data or information, they inform what we do, and we use our professional judgment to move forward. Um, Again, before we get too deep into it, I want to draw your attention to, uh, to some resources that can help you if you want. Um, I've got a website up that you can see at there, www.waymandatause.com. Um, and probably the two most important things to you that are up there are, uh, are my publications. So if you, uh, if you want to read more about the research that I've done, um, pretty much everything I've ever written is up there. You know, if you're just having trouble sleeping, then research articles are great for that, particularly mine. Um, also, my blog may be of use to you. I haven't written much on my blog lately because I just didn't feel like it, but I'm probably going to be picking that up. That's a, a good way to, uh, to engage with some of the ideas that I have. In particular, the paper that today's talk is based on is on the publications link of my website. Um, so all those resources are free. Um, my, my job is to get info out to people and try to help. So if this is helpful to you, go visit my website. There are a bunch of other ways to find me. Um, I encourage you to reach out to me if I can ever do you any good or even if you just have any comments. Uh, I've got my email address there, my Twitter handle. I also run a little Facebook discussion thing, which I also haven't written on much in the last month or two. But if you, if you like doing things through Facebook, you might 
like that. So uh, I'll put this I'll put this slide back up later uh, in case you didn't get to write some of this stuff down now. Um, but I want you to know that, that um, you can reach out to me and find me. So let's talk about what we're going to do today. Um, the objective of today's talk is to help you learn about these uh, strategies that principals can use in leading for data use. Um, I want to help you think about how to use these strategies in your own practice. So the way we're going to accomplish that is we're going to first define what we mean by data, and we're going to go through the strategies, we're going to list the strategies. The bulk of today's talk is going to be discussing each individual strategy, but we're going to do it in groups. Um, I don't mean you're going to be in groups. I mean I'll show you how these strategies kind of group up. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some research that I've conducted on how principals use these strategies. We'll have some summary thoughts. And then at the end, I've got a uh, shareback activity that I want to do with you all and, uh, and see how some of this information struck you. So let's get to it. What do I mean by data? As I was talking, everybody had some definition in their mind, whether it was explicit or not, about what, what data meant to them. And for a lot of us, data means assessments. State assessments, formative assessments, local assessments, and that's true. Those are, those are part of data. But I want you to know that, that today we're talking about data in a very broad sense. Um, data is really any piece of information that helps educators know more about their kids. So you see a long list here. You know, if, if we made this slide a different day, there'd be a lot of, a lot of other things show up on there. And there's probably 150 things that we could put on there. Um, my point is that uh, the data are not just test scores. Test scores are one piece to the puzzle. Um, these other things, teacher made grades and quizzes, um, attendance, uh, teacher observation is a very important data point. So uh, data do not have to be numbers and they do not have to be test scores. They can be words, they can be observations, and we think of it very broadly. The moment you've been waiting for, the 12 strategies. Um, what I did is I led a research team that looked at the literature and looked at what was being talked about in the literature, in the research literature, that principals can do to facilitate data use in their context. Um, through that literature review, we boiled it down into 12 strategies, 12 things that principals can do. Um, I have them listed here, and I'm going to explain what each one of them means um, coming up. But this gives you a sense at, at how these things are, are listed. Um, we're going to actually talk about them in groups. And so these, uh, these strategies, many of them fall into groups or themes, or they can be uh, clustered together to help you think about them. So let's get to that. Um, I want to stress that, uh, that in grouping these strategies, what, what I've done is I've looked at it and said, OK, so how would I think about this if I was a principal? What, uh, uh, which ones would I put together? And so I want to stress that, this is, that as we talk about these in groups, um, we're not going to talk about them in an order. So the first group that I list isn't necessarily the first set of strategies that you should do. And the first strategy that I list isn't necessarily the first strategy you should do. These are equal groups. Um, they all sit on the same level. And they're just ways to help us think about them. So these 12 strategies fall into four groups, or you could put them into four buckets. They're, some of them are base setting strategies, like things that you want to do to make sure that the base of your data use is good and solid and concrete. Um, there are functional strategies. These are things that are logistical. They're turn, turn the crank things that you do. Embedded strategies. Thing, there, there are three of these strategies that are threaded throughout everything that you do, throughout every other strategy. And we'll talk about those. Um, finally, there are principle-specific strategies. These are strategies that, that you principals will engage in but are largely removed of your, from your work with the faculty. There would be things that you do on your own. And so what we're going to do is we're going to spend the bulk of our time here discussing strategies in these four groups. So let's go to it. Let's, uh, let's talk to, 
talk about base setting strategies first. Um, base setting strategies are ones that you use in setting your core culture of data use. I am not telling you that these are the first ones that you have to take care of. But I am telling you that um, the data use is pretty hard if these things aren't solid. Uh, if you blindfolded me and put me in your school and asked me where to start, absent any other knowledge, I'd probably pick one of these four. But it really depends on your context. Some, some of these may already be in great shape. You know, you might find other ones in other groups that you're like, well, we, we need to work on that. Um, so which ones you choose first um, is, is really up to you in your context. But it's pretty hard without getting these done. The four that we're going to talk about from that list of 12, there are four of them we're going to talk about that are base setting strategies. And they are data system support, facilitating collaboration around data, focusing data use on a broad context, and fostering common understandings. And I can tell you if I were teaching my class, see, when I was teaching at UT, uh, we taught three-hour classes. And yes, if you're wondering, I am perfectly capable of talking for three hours without stopping. Um, and it's probably about this point that I would start to look out over my class and see, you know, people start to glaze over, doze off. That's, um, that's human nature. That's one of the reasons why the definition of a professor is somebody who talks in somebody else's sleep. Um, so if I were in class now, I would probably be asking my students to get up and just stand up and then sit back down and get the blood moving again. So if you're getting the fades, it's late in the day. If you're getting the fades, do that for yourself. Stand up and move around and, uh, um, and make this easier on yourself. So, uh, so let's move on to our first base setting strategy, data system support. Um, data system support is when, when you're employing this strategy, it means that you're, you're supporting your staff to use data systems uh, that will help them get information out of the data to inform their practice. Now, when we think of data systems, often I hear data systems talked about as though they're a luxury. Not really a luxury. We all know that we have to have them. Um, but they're really seen as a, as a bell and whistle thing. And I'm here to tell you that data systems are a core component. They are critical to the practice of using data. Um, if you're trying to do this without a data system, it's harder than it needs to be. Um, these, uh, you know, we, we've seen data binders. We've seen Excel spreadsheets. We've seen walls you know, with printouts on them and, and all this. Th those are all fine. Those are good ways to start. But um, those are not the end because you need to have the technology helping you facilitate your work in order to make this happen effectively. Um, and it's hard, if you've started and done well you know, with, with uh, pencil and paper methods, it's hard to get out of that. We, uh, we studied a thing called path dependence. There's a theory of path dependence that says that people will stay on the same path because of the perceived costs of getting off that path. And I get that. I mean, if I'm a middle school teacher and I've got my data binder, and it's super thick, and I know how to run it, um, I don't want to get off that path because there's a cost of going to learn this new data system. Um, but here's where you come in, principals and administrative teams. Your job is to help them get off that path if that's where they are. Your job is to find ways to make these data systems relevant to their practice and to help them mitigate those costs of getting out of whatever other method they're using and get to using a, a data system and making good use of it. How do you do that? Well, one way you do it is that you focus on the data, not the system. Um, the, uh, often, a data system is introduced or is used by showing people how to use the system. And I say turn that around. Never, ever, ever say, OK, everybody, here is the data system, and here are some ways to use it. No, you, uh, you talk about using the data. OK, we need to solve this problem. What data do we need for that? What information do we need? We find that, oh, by the way, um, in the data system, here's how you get it. Click one, two, three, four, you're done. And you move back to solving the data problem. Um, the work we do is never about the data system. It's just a tool. And, and it's important to focus your, your, strat, your leadership around the data. Um, you can make the data valuable for you and your, your people by focusing it on immediately relevant problems. 
the the worst data system training I see. It's it's excruciating. Is when when uh, they're showing everybody how to use a system, and they're showing them data that these people might not ever look at again. You need to be showing them how to use the system to work on a problem that you're working on today, or you got to work on tomorrow. So the immediately relevant problem part is really important. Um, you've got to embed that system use in everyday work. It's it's a it's an important tool that the people have to have, and so they need to be using it in, every day in in some form. They don't have to be experts, but if they use it enough, they'll become very good at what they need to get done. Finally, I'll say that you need to be able to understand the sense that your teachers are making of this system. Here's one thing I know, that you as a principal or an administrator have an idea of how this system should be used. And that's great. You should have that. Your teachers, when they see it, will develop ideas on how that should be used. And sometimes those are going to be the same as yours, and sometimes they're going to be different. And so you need to create feedback loops to understand the sense that they're making of the system, the uses they see as valuable in the system. Um, and then you can continue to support them once you know how they're experiencing the system. So the next strategy that, uh, that we'll talk about is facilitating collaboration around data. Um, when, you're, uh, when you're doing this, you're structuring ways for staff to work together on data issues. And again, it's grounded in practice, as the other one was. Um, However important we, as a group here, think collaboration is, it's more important. I'm always amazed by that. I think collaboration around data use is the most important thing. In fact, you can see in the bullet here, I've got collaboration as the lifeblood of data use. But I'm always, always going, huh, collaboration is more important than I thought it was. And uh, so that, that by itself is good to know. It's easy to imagine that leadership strategy working in a very shallow way. That is, um, we don't understand lots of times when we're implementing the strategy that, that we could go much deeper with it. If I'm a principal and I say, all right, uh, we need to look at our benchmark scores. Um, you guys all have your PLC time. Look at your benchmark scores. Uh, get back to me with whatever you need to fill out, and you go away. Well, you've use that strategy, right? You've facilitated collaboration. I would argue that it hasn't gone deep enough. And I would argue that you haven't leveraged that strategy to its fullest extent, because here's the deal. Um, creating that space for them to collaborate is important, but it's the easy part. As hard as that is to do, it's the easy part. What's really, really super important on top of that is structuring what happens within that collaboration. Think of yourself as the bumpers that they put in the bowling alley for little kids. Um, because without you there as that bumper, or without your leadership there um, as those bumpers, the, uh, the ball's going to get in the gutter. Uh, things are going to go astray. You need to be bumping them back on task. And you need to be supporting the work that they're doing and helping them see how they can collaborate together and work on these problems. Um, so as you imagine your collaboration, uh, or as you imagine, leading for collaboration, one of the things that's really helpful is to be there. I mean, you guys know the importance of just showing up. I'm, I'm not telling you anything new there. It's, it's impossible for you to be at every meeting. We know that. Um, but your teachers need to see you showing up at some of these collaborative meetings and working with them. And, uh, and you need to see what they're talking about. You need to, to hear how things are going for them and, and to see the kind of work that they're doing. So. Collaboration is not just about giving the time and space. It's about helping them work with what happens during that time and space. Um, the third strategy in our core strategies is uh, focusing data use on a broad context. When you're doing this, you're ensuring that it's not just about test scores. You're going beyond state tests to examine the entire spectrum of student learning. Now. This is a natural thing for teachers. Look, all of us, when we think about student learning, I, I challenge you to find anybody who's been in education any amount of time that thinks of student learning in terms of the state test score, right? Now, when we think of the whole child, we know that each kid brings with them 
the sum of their experience, their background, their families, their friends, their former teachers, what they've learned, their strengths, their weaknesses, their abilities, their skills. They bring all this together to create the whole student. And we respond to learning needs in terms of that whole student. This is how teachers think. And so this particular strategy is a very natural one to teachers. Um, it's pretty cut and dried. When, when I'm in schools where, where principals and administrative teams focus data use on test scores, the teachers aren't happy. Those are the schools that I hear saying, well, this isn't what I got into education for. I don't believe in this. I'll, I'll do this, but I, then I go back to teaching. Those are the ones where data use is really divorced from practice. But in the, uh, in the schools that I hear data talked about just as information that helps us know more about the kid, those are the schools that are more likely to be successful. Um, one, of the, one of the ways you get this done is you use multiple data points. Now, you remember that slide earlier. We, uh, we talked about a lot of different data points. And I'll remind you again, data don't have to be numbers. Um, I knew a school one time that demanded that every reading placement decision have at least three data points, one of which had to be teacher observation. They valued their teacher observation as a data point, and I do too. Um, but just like we talked before, this whole student thing is a bunch of pieces to the puzzle. Um, state tests are important. Um, you know, they're one way that we're judged on. It's the thing that they publish in the paper. And so I'm not telling you to forget about state tests, but I am saying that they're one piece to the puzzle. So uh, in focusing data use on a broad context, one of the things that, uh, that you can help your teachers do is a question that I used to ask my students in class all the time. When they would make a point, uh, lots of times I'd say, oh, what in your reading made you think this? So think about that question for your teachers. You know, somebody says, well, I think we need to do this for a student. Oh, yeah? Well, why did you think that? And sometimes it's, you know, my gut tells me to do that. Great. That's a data point. Let's see if we can find more on top of that. You know, maybe it's the test scores say to do this. Great, that's a data point. Let's see if we can find more on top of that. The fourth strategy in our base setting strategies is fostering common understandings. And uh, when you're doing this, you're creating opportunities to build shared ideas and have these conversations that we've never gotten to have before in education. You're having conversations and building shared ideas about teaching and learning and what data can do to serve that. I don't care anything about data for data's sake, right? The data themselves aren't that exciting to me. How they inform teaching and learning and how they serve that is very exciting to me. You know, it's important to note that when I say common understandings, building common understandings, I'm not talking about creating a definition that we all agree on. First of all, I don't think that's possible because studies show that humans move around on, on those beliefs. Um, instead, I'm talking about, well, yeah, it's important to write this stuff down, right? And so definitions are good, vision and mission are good, but what I'm really talking about here is opportunities to do what Senge calls sharing our mental models. Um, we need to have conversations in many different ways about what I mean by teaching and learning, what you mean by teaching and learning. We need to find out where our overlap is. We need to find out where our disagreements are. Um, what you'll find is the more you have of these, um, the more commonality you'll find in your disagreements than you ever thought. But here's the thing. Adding data to this conversation, saying how does data help this, really, really facilitates these conversations because now we're talking about the work. We're not talking about your belief system or my belief system. We're talking about how do we think is the best way to educate these kids. Um, so as, as you're thinking about sharing common understandings and building common understandings as a principle, um, think about it in every activity that you do. It can be in every activity that you do. Um, there can be a little component. This doesn't have to be like a big initiative. This can be pieces all throughout the year. Um, I always recommend that people write these down as much as they can. So if you can find um, if you can find ways to codify this, eventually you build a book of what our organization, what our school 
believes and how we want to do things. Um, the thing I'll stress to you here is the process is so much more important than what you produce. Um, getting people to talk about how they think information supports their work is so critical to what you're trying to do as a principal. And the answers they come up with aren't really that important. They are because they, they feed what you're going to do. But this whole process is the thing that people, people really appreciate out of this. As a result, um, I've never been in a school where we did this, or I've never talked to any of my students when I was teaching that, where the teachers did not like doing this. Um, by doing this, you're giving them a voice. You're respecting them. You're finding out their opinion. You're allowing them to build and have a hand in things that are going to affect them. You're, you're saying, you're the pros. You're the ones that are going to have to spend six hours with these kids in the classroom today. How do we want to get this done? If, like I say, no, these aren't necessarily the first things that you had to do. But if somebody put a gun to my head and said, hey, in this school, what's one thing that you have to do? I'd pick common understandings because I'm almost bet that that the school that I'm in hasn't done this yet, and I think it's just so critical. Without these common understandings, it's hard to do everything else. So let's, uh, let's talk about the functional strategies now. Um, these are strategies that are more turn the crank things. Um, they're the ones that are actual logistical activities that we take on, things like asking the right questions, how we communicate with data, and, uh, and goal setting. So let's talk about them. Um, asking the right questions is about providing support for your staff and teachers to identify relevant problems and choose the approaches that are going to help solve those problems. Um, in doing this, if you, can, if you can help your teachers get good at formulating good questions and identifying where they want their efforts placed, what kind of outcomes they might get, you go a long way towards reducing anxiety around data. Because what I've seen time and time again is the thing that takes teachers' breath away is when they get this data dumped on them, and they're like, oh my gosh, what do I do with all this data? And if you can help them be really specific and concrete and clear in asking questions that they need to know the answer to and identifying a course on how you can get those, then all they have to do is say, oh, I want to know the answer to this. So which data would help me do that? This, this, and this. Great, I'm working with three data points instead of 178. And that is a helpful thing. Um, now, here is a reality. Not that many of us are good at this. This isn't a natural skill for human beings. And it's not something that we've gotten a lot of preparation in. Um, I mean, I've got a math background. And I'm not particularly good at it. The, uh, the, the fact is that this one is an easy one to let slide because we need help on it. Now, there may be some people in the audience here today who are fantastic at it. That's good. Tell us who you are <laughs> so that we can all get your help. Um, most of us are going to have to practice this. Um, we're going to have to go find reading, you know, maybe some workshops or something. But it's an important thing to make yourself stay on. Here's why it's easy to let slide. If I'm a principal and I'm not that good at asking the right questions or I'm not that trained in asking the right questions, then when somebody is not doing it like they need to do, it's hard for me to step up and say, hey, you need to do that right. Because somebody's going to turn around and say, so how do I do it? And you're like, uh, let me get back to you on that. Hold your staff accountable for these questions. These are tough things. But in holding them accountable, also give them support. That's what the strategy is about. And so as you hold them accountable, remember that they're going to need to learn this. So maybe you're going to have to go find professional development. Maybe there's somebody in your district or on your staff that's good at this that can help you with questioning. Maybe you're good at it and you need to, uh, to help people. But just know that this isn't something that, that they are going to take to naturally. And, uh, and you're going to need to support them on it. The next strategy um, in our functional strategies list is communicating with data. Um, when you're doing this, you're clarifying 
for staff and parents, um, teachers, students, other stakeholders, how data are going to be used and what these data mean. So in doing this, um, you're going to be taking control of the data and the information that comes out of your school. Here's a big benefit of this. Uh, what we're seeing right now is a big backlash about data because of privacy concerns. And the reason a lot of this is coming around is not because we're not taking care of our data well, and there's a little bit of that, but it's because people are suddenly aware that these data are being collected and that they're being used. And so the questions are being asked, why do you want this data on my kid? Well, in a lot of cases, that data has been collected for decades, um, but it was never talked about. So now all of a sudden, it's out in the open. Why do you want this data for my kids? Well, we, uh, we have good reasons for this. So let's communicate those reasons. It's going to go a long way towards, uh, towards settling down some of that anxiety. Um, the, uh, the clarity that you can undertake in communicating with data really helps the data become non-threatening to people. And I'm not t just talking stakeholders. I'm talking your teachers, too. Why? The thing that our junior high kids ask us, why do we have to do this, right? Well, be clear about why do we have to do this. How will this help us? It'll help you, too. Because if you have to articulate to people why this will be helpful, you might find that sometimes uh, using this particular set of data isn't that helpful. That's how your teachers can help you, um, that kind of feedback. The, uh, the truth is that everybody's got data now. Um, it's, it's hard for schools and leaders to really be proactive in communicating around data because there's a simple truth about education that the more we say about what we're doing, the more people start calling us up, right? And uh, we, we start talking a lot about how we're using data. We open ourselves up to questions and red flags and people show up in our office and ask us things. And so in a lot of times, it's a lot easier just to say nothing uh, because then nobody bothers us. You know, those days are gone now because everybody's got data. And so you've got to get past that idea, even if it's just in the back of your mind. You've got to get past that because um, everybody's got data and they're telling the story for you. So that bullet there is really important. Tell your story or someone else will. Um, and there, there are a lot of strategies you can use. There, there are a million different ways that you can communicate with data. I've listed a few here, you know, um, memos, newsletters, websites, and all that. But even informal discussion, they're useful. It's, what you should do is endeavor in everything you do to set people at ease. Here, here's what we're doing. Here's why it's going to help us. And here's how we're going to do it. Um, goal setting is another of these functional strategies. The uh, goal setting is kind of a larger version of asking the right questions, but it operates differently because goal setting is about setting the benchmarks and, uh, and the places where you want to be for this particular student or for this particular teacher or for this uh, particular subject area or for our school or whatever. Here's the other thing, though. You need to tailor your data use to support attainment of those goals of those benchmarks. Um, there's a lot of benefits to doing this. What this is is it's a roadmap. It's a plan for what you're going to do. Um, you, uh, if you lay out your clear path and where you want to be, your destination, what this goal is, if you brainstorm and think about other destinations you could end up, right? I mean, we set a goal of whatever for the student. Well, student might not end up there. They might end up in a different place, OK? So let's forecast some of those. If you do those things, you can create a lot of benefit for your school and your staff and your students because everybody's more clear now on what we're doing. And you now have the opportunity to support the work of getting there. So that bottom bullet is a pretty important one. It's not just setting the goal. <laughs> We've, I mean, those, those of us who have been in education a while have been have been setting goals for years, right? And how many times have we set that goal? You know, well, we, we need to set this goal here. You do it in September or October, and it never sees the light of day, okay? The goal setting is only important for you so that you can support the work of reaching that destination. Um, and as you might guess, collaboration is, uh, is a really, really helpful way to get this done. Um, 
So the, uh, let's move on to the embedded strategies. I need to advance my slide. So now we're going to talk about the group of embedded strategies. And uh, these are the most interesting. As, as I'm looking at my time here, these are the ones I have to be careful on. Because <laughs> I could talk another three hours on these embedded strategies. Um, and they're, they're interesting because they're threaded throughout all the other strategies. They're ones that we talk about as though they're separate, unique things. But to be honest with you, it's hard to imagine employing any of these strategies without a piece of it, at least a little piece of these. We're talking The three we're talking about here are distributing leadership, ensuring adequate professional learning, and structuring time to use data. Um, people gravitate towards these. These are fun ones to talk about. They're fun ones to talk about because they're really practically based, but on the other side, um, they're, uh, they're nice, they're familiar, and here's the deal. They're really big, and we can talk about them easily without going into a lot of detail. I'm going to repeat that. These are fun to talk about because these are ones that we can talk about easily without going into a lot of detail. And that's where these fail, is when we stop going into the detail. What I'm going to describe in talking about these three strategies is, is how you can understand these and how you can see these as threaded throughout the others. If you can get there, they're very complex strategies that way, but if you can get there, you can make them work for you. So let's talk about distributing leadership first. Um, distributing leadership. Gosh, we've had this ad nauseum for the last 20 years. Uh, it's creating opportunities for staff to, uh, to I, I picked three words here that I think are important, perform, create, and own data-related activities. To me, distributed leadership is as much about ownership as it is about leadership. I think that's how you get to leadership when, when your principal is, is uh, uh, dosing out ownership to people. Um, we like it because it creates investment. If, if you can get this right, um, your people will follow you in, in much better shape. Um, and you can, th this also can be a time saver for you. I'm, I'm not telling the principals here anything new when, when I say that there are only 24 hours in a day, right? And you only work some of those 24 hours, too many. Go home early today, please. Um, but you, you need help in doing this stuff, right? Therefore, distributing leadership, uh, to do this, you can lean heavily on collaboration, on your teachers, on your support staff, and all this. But you also know that there are problems with distributing leadership. One problem is that as a principal, if you've distributed leadership well, you've done all these things that the books tell us to do, you know, you've given leadership to these other people, well, when something goes wrong, nobody calls these other people. They call you. Right? It's your desk that the buck is going to stop on. And so it's, it's a, uh, there's an interesting tension around distributing leadership that, as they've studied it, they found out that principals and leaders in other organizations are reluctant to distribute leadership because they've got to make sure it goes right. Um, so I say, for data use, that because of that, you want to be very careful in launching into distributed leadership. I think you need to do it. But I think you need to do it slowly. It's really hard to do up front. If you don't have some of these um, base setting strategies in place, I, I fear that distributed leadership will blow up on you in different spots. Um, there's a lot of trust that has to be set. There, there are a lot of skills that have to be set that may not be there. So I'm saying look to do this, but look to do it slow. Let's build this like we build a culture. Um, the other thing is I would watch out for whether you are creating systems of distributed power. The research on distributed leadership talks about that there are a lot of instances where distributed leadership actually just rewards the people who are on my side, um, the people in my dyad, the people in my in-group, and so I give them more power. And the other people are marginalized. And so you want to watch that, that you're not doing that. Um, our next strategy is ensuring adequate professional learning. This one's the one that I love. Um, the, uh, this, one, this one is one that I always taught when I was teaching my class. It was the last strategy that I would teach. And the students at the start of this class, uh, start of the class where we taught professional learning, would say, oh my gosh, 
this one ties up everything. In fact, I've thought about, I, I think you need to have it in here as a strategy, but really there's hardly anything that I've talked about that isn't about professional learning. So, you know, the definition is ensuring that educators consistently engage in immediately relevant professional learning opportunities. In some sense, that goes without saying, but look at a couple of modifiers in there that are really important. Immediately relevant. I want you to think about that a second. When we think professional learning, we often think professional development. And when we think professional development, we think of classrooms, we think of auditoriums, we think of people up in front saying things. And that's part of it. That's an important part of data-related professional learning. But I'm telling you, don't make that your whole conception of this. Don't get caught up in these traditional formats. Um, in truth, there are opportunities everywhere in your school building, just on Thursday and Friday of this week, where you can find ways that people can gain professional learning on data use. In doing so, I think you've got to turn the traditional ideas of professional learning on their side. Yeah, because of policies, um, we do need these traditional formats. I mean, we've got teacher you know, career ladder, we've got uh, ways that teachers are evaluated, and some of these, sometimes you just have to show that you went to a class. And those can be good things, too. But I'm saying, as you think about professional learning, think about how you're going to embed it in everyday work. What? You mean everything my teachers do has to have a professional learning component? That's hard. Yeah, not, it's not too bad once you, get to, once you get to brainstorming them on ways to do it. Because if you think about your professional learning in terms of the expertise that you can draw from people and that you can build in people, then you can see how these can come out in little 30-second, 2-minute, 10-minute bites. Um, so that's why that, that bullet there says think expertise, not experts. You know, if, if somebody needs to learn something, you don't have to go find somebody from the district or hire a high-priced consultant to come teach something. You can build that expertise in your staff. And if you look to do that over a long period of time through every other strategy that we've talked about so far, um, you'll create a very, very competent staff in using data, and you'll create a more competent you because they'll feed this information back to you. Um, so, uh, so this one, uh, this one's my favorite one probably because it ties everything up. Um, the final strategy in this group is structuring time to use data. The uh, in structuring time to use data, we're this is about scheduling dedicated time for campus faculty to examine and reflect upon data. Okay, that's fine, that's, that's the definition, but it's not just that. Every time we talk about time in using data, we talk about, well, when are we going to give them time? You look at my older writings, probably, as, um, probably up to about 2008, I'm talking about time as a separate thing. Now I'm thinking about it as embedded in everything because when we're talking about this strategy, structuring time to use data, we're not talking about giving time. We're talking about growing time. We're talking about nurturing time. It's not just about carving out that time. Like collaboration, that's the easy part, even as hard as that is. Um, you've got to structure and support what goes on in that time. So as you might guess, time and collaboration are really, really closely um, related. You think about them very similarly. There, you look around your school, there are a lot of different structures that no doubt you've already decided how to leverage. You know, your planning time, team meetings, PLCs, and all that stuff. So I can't tell you anything. Um, you could probably teach me a thing or two on how to leverage your schedule. But um, I want to leave this slide with one more thing for you to think about on time. That when we, what, what I've seen in visiting 15 billion schools is when we think about time to use data, we think of the actual action of using data. So I'm going to download the data, I'm going to analyze it, I'm going to you know, put a, whatever I'm going to do with it to come up with a decision. We don't leave enough time for process and reflection, and teachers need that. So I'll leave you with that one. As you're thinking about structuring time, as you're thinking about creating collaborative structures, 
make sure you're giving your teachers enough time once they get some data to chew on it a little bit, talk about it a little bit, reflect on it, make a good decision. We will now move on to the fourth group, which is the principal specific strategies. Um, these are ones, as I said, I've kind of toyed with the idea of, of taking these out here because they aren't ones where you work specifically with your faculty. Oh, and in one of them you do a little bit. But this is really centered on your own practice. Um, these are, there are two that fall into here. One of them is in engaging in personal learning opportunities, and one of them is in modeling data use. And uh, so let's talk about those two real quick. Personal learning opportunities, the, you, you can read that definition there, and basically it says you got to keep up. Right? Again, like I told you before, we're all on the same footing, right? Um, it's hard to be the expert when you started from the same place as everybody else did. And by and large, in American schools, that's true uh, in, in terms of data use. Um, if you employ these strategies that I've discussed here really well, um, you will build so much capacity in your teachers that they are going to get so far out in front of you and it's going to be a beautiful thing. Every really successful data using context I've seen has that because this because teachers take off with this capacity building. And so that's why this Gandhi quote is there. You, you will be in this situation if you do this right. There go my people. I must catch them for I am their leader. Um, and that will happen to you if you do it right. Now, what that means is that uh, but you got to stay up. It's, it's, it's hard to make yourself stay up on your data skills, um, but you need to because I, I know you have other people you need to be leading, but you got to take care of yourself too. And don't forget, you got to keep up with your leadership skills. The stuff that I'm, I'm throwing a lot of information to you, at you today, and a lot of it is stuff that most principals um, either haven't heard before or haven't thought of in this way around data use. My group may be different here, um, but these these leadership skills that I'm talking about are going to take some honing, and they're going to mean that you need to keep going to learn things. So give yourself time for reading. You know, find a time where you can be gone and go attend a workshop. Do something, but keep up. Um, this enables good modeling, which is the next strategy. And your uh, your teachers need to see you using data in effective ways. They need to know that. Uh, that you're practicing what you preach. And you can talk all you want to about it, but these actions are going to mean a thousand words. Um, meetings are a good forum for this. When, when you collaborate with your teachers, um, it's a really good way for them to see you doing this. It, doing this sets a direction, gives them something to look towards. But here's the deal. If I were a principal and I were a little bit worried about my data skills, this would scare me. Because I'm like, ooh, I have to be the exemplar. Just remember this. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be fantastic about it. You just have to try. You have to be trying to do the right thing. And just have to be good at it. That's all. Anybody can get good at this. So from here, I want to talk real quickly about some of the research that I've done on these 12 strategies. And I'm going to make this quick because um, because there are a couple of main things that you need to know for your own practice here. One is that in the schools that we studied, once we identified these strategies, we went to study schools in three districts, 30 some odd schools, um, and, uh, and we, we tried to find out which, which of these strategies were being employed. Only three of them are employed with any regularity. Um, the, I've got the three listed here, and even those weren't applied that well. So the most commonly employed one was focusing data use on a broad context, but these principles kept it fairly shallow. They didn't go nearly as deep with the triangulation of their data or with learning more about their kids like they could have. Um, we, uh, we saw principles um, fostering collaboration, but in fostering that, they didn't structure what happened inside the collaboration. Right? So they, were, they did well in carving out the time, but they never went any further than that. And distributing leadership was one that they did, but to be honest with you, it wasn't distributed leadership. It was distributed work. Um, they were just doling out tasks. 
and that's an okay start, but you need to move towards leadership if you're going to build capacity. A couple of interpretations of these results that are important for you all is, one, that they employed these strategies, but they weren't intentional about it. Um, they didn't say, like, I hope you do after this webinar, okay, there are some specific things that I need to do around my leadership for data use that can help people, uh, help my teachers get where they need to be. I mean, you got to sit down and talk about this with your staff. You, 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 have, to, you have to write these things out. You have to be intentional. Um, the, uh, the strategies that they employed fit well within the familiar. That was when we wrote the discussion section. That was the word that we used. Is the, these were familiar things, and it makes sense. I mean, you go towards what you know, and what these teachers or what these principals had were collaborative structures. You know, in terms of PLCs, they had people around them who could help them with the work. So it's distributing leadership, and we all think in terms of the whole child. So focusing on a broad context wasn't too hard for them. But there are nine strategies that they didn't use at all, and. Um, for you out here if you want to take it. So uh, let, me, let me put up some closing thoughts here before we go to our activity. Um, one thing is, as I mentioned before, you've got to be intentional. Um, you have to say, now, you know what, I'm going to do this. And it's got to be something that you work on every day, every week. Um, but the important thing about that, while that while you're sitting there going, OK, yeah, Mr. Ivory Tower, um, really nice for you to tell me to be intentional because i got all this time to do it, right? No, it's not that. Um, be subtle about these. Most of these things are going to go unnoticed. I'm not talking big, giant initiatives. You know, I'm talking about um, when you think about, for instance, structuring time to use data. You think, well, so many of those other strategies fit in here. You know, if I support their questioning, their time will be used better. If you support their collaboration, their time will be used better. If you support how they use data systems, their time will be used better. Um, and that's not something that, that you make an announcement, I'm now going to structure time better. And you do it in subtle ways. That's how a lot of these will be applied. Don't do all the strategies at once. If you heard 12 strategies and think you're going to go to work tomorrow and employ 12 strategies, then you may resign by Friday. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a lot of work. My advice, start with one. Pick the one that you think, oh, I think I can do something good with this, with what I learned. Eh, maybe if you need to pull a piece of a couple other strategies in, fine. But take it slow. Take them one at a time. Build towards this, because as the next bullet says, you're focusing on capacity building in your staff, right? You want to build their capacity. Um, so in terms of that, let them take the lead. It's still your school. You still need to, to set, chart the course. You still need to set the direction. But a lot of research on leadership shows that good leaders get things started, and then they let their organization show them the direction they need to go. Um, I'm going to paraphrase something I heard Stephen Katz at the University of Toronto say one time. If data use is an event, you don't have a culture. So I'm talking, if your data use is centered mostly around set-aside events, um, early release, data day. Um, we get three professional development days a year, and so we use those to use data. Stuff like that, those are event-based things. A good start. It's a good way to work people in. But if that's your end, then you don't have a culture. Because what happens to you, if data use is an event, then your teachers, I want you to hear this, because this is important. Um, if data use is an event that forces your teachers into a choice of, do I do data or do I do something else to my practice? Do I plan my lessons or do I use data? Do I have a parent conference or do I use data? And that divorces it from our work. This is data. It's just information, right? It's embedded in everything that we do. So as I plan my lessons, what data do I need? As I go to this parent conference, what data do I need? What information do I need? What's going to help me think through this? So don't make it an event. Finally, 
I'll, I'll just remind you again something I've said, that nobody prepares you to do this. Um, th that, you know, maybe some, there may be plenty of you have, have some better preparation, but I can tell you nationwide, preparation for this is not good, both from your districts, from your universities. Um, you were just stuck with this. And because you're the principal, because you're in charge, you know, now you've got to know how to do it. So cut yourself some slack. Build towards this. Start to infuse these things in your practice. And trust me, your teachers will love you. I've never been in a school that the principal did this really well, that the teachers weren't just like, oh, my gosh, I love this principal. So uh, anyway, um, we're going to move to our activity, but I want to remind you again of ways to find me. Um, I would love to keep this conversation going in, in some form. The, uh, so reach out to me. If you have, you know, um, later on tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, you get questions, send them to me. I'm happy to have a conversation. Um, you have comments. If you think I got something wrong, if you think I have something right, whatever. If you have a problem that you're like, gosh, I don't know how to do this. Maybe Wayman knows something about it. Reach out to me. You can reach me through my website, uh, email. Twitter and Facebook. So, uh, yeah. So reach out to me. Um, now, if you're still awake, um, I want to do a uh, our final activity. Well, while, while you've been while you've been listening, you've undoubtedly. Comment on that comment. Well, I do wish we had another hour or two to discuss this. I think this is so helpful. I know a lot of the schools have commented how helpful this is. Um, as you do continue to process and reflect on this information, then um, we encourage you to send any um, questions you have to Dr. Wayman himself or to Megan Carroll, who will compile those questions and um, send them on to Dr. Wayman. We also have a feedback survey here. I know some of the schools have had to sign off, and so we'll be sending this link to them. But if you have just a couple of minutes, we encourage you to fill this out. It's just a couple of questions, relatively painless, but it does help us gather some data so that we can do a better job of supporting you in the future. Um, so unless there are any last questions or comments. I, I actually have a last comment, if you don't mind. Um, I just want to congratulate the people on this call for the good work you're doing. You know, I, I don't know about any of you personally or your schools, but I know from talking to Christy and Jacob and other people at, at the Meadows Center, that, uh, that this is a really interesting partnership that you have. And just the fact that you're engaged in it means you're doing good work. So congratulations for that. Um, congratulations for being interested enough in your profession to take on something like this. And thank you for the work you do. Yes, we're so pleased to be working with all of these schools. It's um, very exciting work. And they have been so wonderful to work with. Um, the year is just getting started and everyone's been busy, but everyone is diligently focused on the goals that they set and uh, sharing that work with each other so that we can grow together as a community. And Dr. Wilson, thank you so much for taking the time to prepare this presentation, um, share all the information with us, and, and being available to our schools as a resource. <coughs> we really appreciate you. So with that, we are going to sign off. And again, let us know if you have any further questions. Hope you all have a good evening. Thanks, Thank everybody. Bye-bye.